finds herself uh, doing more and more of these presentations um, and starting to make some real change in her own community. So I thought she would be excellent to hear from before we go to our climate.
Change expert panel coming up uh, right now. We are a little bit late, but that's okay. We're able to push it a little bit uh, into 11 and we'll make up that time. So yeah, this is one of our big sessions of the 2021 Canadian Rockies Youth Summit. And we have a really great panel planned. So before we begin, I'm just gonna give a land acknowledgement. In the spirit of truth, uh, respect and reciprocity, we honor and acknowledge the Canmore area known as the Chuwap Chipchin Kudib and the traditional tree seven territory and oral practices of the Eyarhe Nakoda comprised of the Bearspaw, Chiniki and Wesley First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Blackfoot Confederacy comprised of the Siksika, the Kani and Kainai. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We acknowledge all the nations who live, work, and play, and help us steward this land, honor, and celebrate this territory. So thank you, uh, everybody here again for joining us. The Canadian Rockies Youth Network is a group of youth, uh, and it's network driven by youth, um, for youth. So with our partner, the Biosphere Institute of the Bow Valley, we have co-designed and co-created this network that connects our body with youth and make sure that they are consulted on land management decisions. So the theme of this summit this year is turning hope into action. And we hope that you take the knowledge that you gain from the summit and you get to use that to create positive action in your community. If you do decide to start taking action, um, you can head on over to our Instagram page where we are hosting a take action contest. That's where we're gonna show some small actions that you can take in your community. And uh, when you, share that with us and tag your post with us you are going to be entered for a chance to win some really cool prizes including um, a guided hike at lake louise which is pretty amazing also we have another challenge called the canadian rocky sorry the rockies repeat youth climate challenge so in this challenge you're going to travel via google earth to some of our rockies repeat painting locations the Athabasca Glacier, Lake MacArthur, Victoria Lake, and the Blow, Gla uh, Blow Glacier, Wilcox Pass, all these places. Then it's your turn to create um, some sort of medium of your choice with watercolor, ink, sketching, uh, to paint a glacial landscape. So if you post and tag us on Instagram with that, um, your piece of art, you will have a chance to be featured on as part of the Rockies Repeat Initiative which is pretty amazing. Also with us today, we have Caroline Hedden, who is the founder of Rockies Repeat. So she'll probably talk about that today. That's quite an amazing project we have going on. Last thing I'd like to do before we start the panel is that just to thank our sponsors and partners, of course, the Biosphere Institute of the Bow Valley, who we've partnered with to create this network and also uh, the Calgary Foundation and the Assembly of First Nations um, from, for their generous grants. Without these partners, we would not be able to bring our environmental education to you. Sorry for that terrible fun. Um, <laughs> so thank you for the support. Right now, our focus is on the climate. Uh, we've heard enough about how the climate is an issue right now, but what are the actual effects that our generation is gonna see? And what are some creative solutions to solve this problem? So we have lined up five different uh, mini presentations on what a changing climate means for our generation. So during the presentations, please think of any questions that you may have and enter them into our Mentimeter link, which will be linked into the chat. That is a Q&A section. There are also some questions with that link, but you should be able to access the Q&A whenever, regardless of whichever question you're on. So every question, every presentation will be about five minutes and there's about 25 minutes afterwards for your questions. So here's our lineup today. First, we have Caroline Hedden, a filmmaker and founder of the Canadian Rockies Repeat. Next, we have Ben Pelto, a PhD student from uh, the University of Northern British Columbia. Then Veronica Whitney Crossland and Jenny Bishop, who are gonna tag team a business perspective. Sorry, my Zoom is really messing up. Uh, who are gonna tag team a business perspective they are both from the Lake Louise Ski Resort. Afterwards, we have Dr. Justina Ray from the Wildlife Conservation Society Canada on the impacts of climate change on our wildlife. Justina is really involved in conservation management and policy in Northern Boreal landscapes. And finally, we have Jody Connell from the Biosphere Institute to talk about advocacy, advocacy, and the implementation of change on the community level. 
She is the coordinator of the Biosphere Institute, Institute's SHIFT program, where she encourages citizens of the Bow Valley to take action on the climate. So, wow, we have a lot of people today. I'm really excited to hear from all of them. So, yeah, uh, click the link in the chat for questions. And without anything further ado, here is Caroline. Hello, everyone. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again for having me. And my name is Caroline, as introduced, and I am a director and filmmaker based here in Canmore, which is in Treaty 7 territory. And today I'm gonna to be telling you about a new exciting project I've been working on with some amazing local artists. Uh, it's called Rocky's Repeat. And it's a documentary project that looks at climate change through the eyes of emerging artists. Speaking of eyes, um, I'm gonna get you to close yours and think of the Rockies and think of the first thing that um, comes to mind. And for many of you, it might be wildlife or rivers, um, but for most of you, it probably, so a landscape like this uh, comes to mind uh, with rugged mountains and sheer rock faces, all capped in ice. Um, the glaciers are what define the Canadian Rockies. It what gives um, the, the Alpine lakes their beautiful blue color. And it's what makes them separate from the, from the American Rockies. Um, and it really just is part of who we are as mountain people and as Canadians. It's so core to our identity. But these places are threatened. And I know that, that Ben will speak to this in greater detail. Um, but the Canadian Rockies are being impacted by climate change at such an alarming rate. Um, and by 2100, we are at risk of losing some of these glaciers that really define this place. So we know that there's a, a really clear role for scientists in this moment to research the impacts that are happening in the, in the, in the Rockies, uh, to take all the measurements and, and communicate that to the public. But what is the role for artists and creatives and musicians um, to document this moment in time? That's something that we're really curious about for Rockies Repeat. So we've taken a team of uh, young women and two-spirit artists uh, from Treaty 7, um, and we are actually, we're going back to the exact painting locations uh, that were first painted by early map artist, Catherine Rob White, nearly a century ago. And the reason we're doing that is for three main um, goals. So one, to elevate indigenous voices that are sometimes left out of discussions about mountain culture and to really re to uh, see mountain places as indigenous spaces. To, to uh, pay tribute to women creators like Catherine Rob White, who really opened up uh, the future for, uh, for women creators in the mountains. And obviously three, uh, to raise awareness about climate change and really hit people's hearts um, about the, the impacts of the climate crisis in the Rockies. So this project is taking us to some of the most iconic places in the mountains that will probably be familiar to most of you, uh, including Lake O'Hara, Bow Lake, uh, and the Athabasca Glacier area. Uh, so our artistic study area kind of spans around 400 kilometers in the Southern Rockies. And the changes we're seeing at each of these locations has just been extraordinary. Um, because you know if climate change is real, but to actually see it with your own eyes is, is just wild. Uh, so on the right hand side there, uh, that's one of our artists, Kayla, holding up a print of Catherine Rob White's painting um, of a snow dome, which is right beside the Athabasca Glacier. And you can see like even being in the exact same location uh, on the landscape, you're just experiencing a completely different place than she would have a, a century before. Uh, and on the, the left-hand side, that's Kayla with her interpretation from that, um, that place on the landscape. 
And it's really interesting because um, artists are kind of like scientists in the moment in this, um, like when you're doing plain air painting, you're sitting, you're not just taking a picture and moving on, you're sitting in place, you're studying the landscape, you're making observations, but it also blends with your own feelings and emotions and uh, the atmosphere of being um, on the landscape. Uh, so we're really seeing this kind of three dimensional emotive perspective of um, a place in time. So we are wrapping up our field season this year uh, and we want you to be part of it. Uh, we have a couple more locations to go to. Uh, and as Ben introduced at the beginning, um, we have launched a youth challenge. You can find all the details in the chat or on our website at rockiesrepeatfilm.com. And we want you to travel to our locations um, digitally. So use, you'll use Google Earth to travel to our painting sites and create your own interpretation uh, and how this, uh, these places make you feel. Um, and yeah, if uh, you enter, uh, you could have a chance to be featured as part of our project. And even if you don't wanna participate in the challenge, we encourage you to follow along. So we're on Facebook and Instagram and also on our website. Um, so yeah, very excited to, uh, to hear all your questions and all, and all the great presenters today. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much uh, for, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. That's a really cool challenge for all of our youth out here. Um, I'm definitely going to give one a shot, even though I'm not an artist, but I think it's still something that'd be very fun to do. Next up, we have Ben Pelto, the glaciologist. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. All right. Well, thank you, Ben, for the invite. And uh, we got the, is the presentation up for you guys now. It's looking good. Yes, looks great. Okay. All right, well, thanks guys. So I am I was a PhD student. I'm now a doctor working at the University of British Columbia. And over the last seven years, I've been studying glaciers in the Columbia and Rocky Mountains of BC and Alberta. Um, and now I'm also working on coast mountain glaciers. So I'm just gonna to talk to you a little bit about glaciers here, especially in the Rockies. Um, so, you know, why are glaciers important in our region? Well, there's almost 18,000 glaciers between British Columbia and Alberta. and I would argue anyway that they have great cultural significance. I think that they're beautiful, iconic, and inspiring parts of the landscape. Um, and they've been part of this landscape alongside the First Nations all over the province, but particularly in these glaciated regions for millennia. Uh, the glaciers are very important as a water resource, and that's something I'll be talking quite a bit about. They essentially act as free and natural on-demand water towers. They're important for things like aquatic ecosystems, as well as hydropower or our own domestic use of water. Glaciers also drive tourism and recreation. Um, you know, they, they help drive, whether that's just simple sightseeing in the national park and provincial parks, or things like uh, backcountry skiing. And they, you know, that also brings a lot of revenue to the province. Something like heli skiing, for example, brings around $350 million a year to British Columbia and a lot of that being centered around glaciers. When we talk about glaciers from a science perspective, we often talk about glacier mass balance or how much a glacier is gaining or losing. Uh, and glacier mass balance is the sum of snow in the winter or accumulation and snow and ice melt in the summer months. Some of those terms is the mass balance. So if we have more accumulation than melt, we have a positive mass balance. Unfortunately, the case in Western Canada and, and globally is one of neg prevailing negative mass balance. And as you can see here, um, this is a 2000 to 2019 height change from some satellite imagery uh, of the Columbia ice field. And you may be familiar with some of these glaciers, particularly the Athabasca Glacier at center. That's if you've ever driven the ice fields parkway, the Athabasca is the most visible glacier directly across from the visitor center that has those big tour buses going out on it. Uh, the Dome Glacier is one that Carolyn just featured in a number of paintings and pictures. And what we can see here is that from 2000 to 2019, over this roughly two decade period, the toe of the Athabasca Glacier has lost roughly 50 meters of thickness. If we go down to the larger Saskatchewan Glacier, 
on the Columbia ice field, that thickness change is closer to 100 meters of loss in the last 20 years. Now, one of the most important things about these glaciers is uh, runoff from glaciers. This cartoon shows us that in the spring months, initially we get a bunch of snow melt from glacierized areas. And then as we go into the hotter, drier summer months, say July, August, and early September, we start to get a lot of ice melt. So again, from October to May, we're gaining snow on the glaciers. And then around the end of April, early May, we start to melt and we see, experience melt and runoff from the glaciers until we start getting snow again sometime in September or October. But what's happening with climate change is that springs on average are coming about two weeks earlier. So we're starting the melt season earlier and then summers are hotter and drier. So we get more melt during the summer because of more extreme temperatures but also a longer melt season. So essentially the melt season is, is strengthening and lengthening. And that's what's causing our glaciers uh, to lose mass and outpace uh, winters. Now glacier runoff is really important to many rivers. And this is an example of the Bow River at Banff. The blue line, if I can get your attention on the blue line, that's 1910 and the amount of water flowing at the Bow River in Banff. This is uh, 2000. And we can see that there's been a substantial drop in the flow of the Bow River during that period. Earlier spring runoff, as I mentioned, but also decreased spring runoff. But one of the most important is decreased summer flow. And the reason that's important is you can see the river is lower in those months, but it's also a biologically important time of year. And species like salmon rely on cool, plentiful water. And glaciers, uh, as the natural water towers that they are, the hotter and drier it is, the more water they produce. And as they shrink, they'll be less able to do that and buffer those periods of low flow. Now, the importance of glacier runoff depends on where you are, what, what catchment you're in, what watershed you're in. Um, looking at this graph here, we can see three places that are gonna be, that, that water, three places where the water source is highly dependent on glaciers. And the Bighorn Dam, Lake Louise, and Hinton all rely on glacier-fed rivers. And so these, the, the solid curves here are showing essentially the amount of water or the runoff now, and the dashed curves are when they lose glaciers over the next 50 to 100 years. So that's without glaciers. So we can see there's gonna be a substantially lower amount of runoff. Other places like Banff or Jasper, at least in the short term, won't feel this effect because while they have uh, glacier-fed rivers in town in both locations, the water source is a deep aquifer. That doesn't mean it won't be affected long-term, but short-term anyway, they won't municipally feel the effect of that. I'd like to conclude with saying that what we do matters. Um, this here is a, model, uh, a modeled example of the Columbia ice field from 2010 to 2000, 2100. And this first panel here, this first row of panels, is under essentially if we meet the Paris Climate Agreement of keeping warming around two degrees Celsius. If that's the case, at the at relative to 1980 at 2100, we expect to have 15 to 45 percent of the ice volume left in the southern Rockies. So think of roughly Jasper down to the U.S. border. If we only manage to do a slight reduction relative today, some moderate reduction in our emissions. The Columbia ice field, as you can see here, will be much reduced, but still, still intact. The Southern Rockies will only have 10 to 30% of the ice they did in 1980. And if we keep on our current trajectory, our business as usual trajectory, as you may have heard it called, what you'll see with the Columbia ice field here is, won't be an ice field at all, in fact, anymore. It will be a few residual patches of ice uh, that you won't be able to see from the highway anymore. And the Southern Rockies in general, will be left with somewhere between no ice and 10% of the ice that was there in the 1980s. Uh, thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much. Um, wow, like I, in my EEI class, I go out to Jasper um, often and we always look at the Athabasca Glacier and it's, just really crazy to see that, you know, that's receding very quickly. And, you know, in our lifetime, it might get to a point where that glacier might not be anymore. So yeah, that's a pretty heavy topic. So 
next up, uh, sorry. <laughs> next up, we have Veronica and Jenny who are going to talk about the Lake Louise Ski Resort. Welcome, Veronica and Jenny. Good morning, and thank you. Hopefully, you can all see me. Um, Mallory, Ben, thank you for inviting the Lake Louise Ski Area and uh, the entire Canadian Rockies Youth Summit. Um, we're happy to be here. Um, Jenny is going to just go over some broad um, warming climate, how warming climates are expected to change the ski area. Hi, everybody. Happy to be speaking with you guys today. Hopefully you can see and hear my screen. Um, so just to sort of briefly introduce us, we have sort of had a couple environmental assessments done at the ski area at Lake Louise to kind of guide us through what, what we might expect under different climate scenarios. And sort of a really big effect for us that's been shown is the length of our winter ski season is going to change. So a lot of that has to do with obviously the onset of temperatures coming on for snow and snow making at the ski resort. Um, in addition to the timing and type of precipitation that we might receive here. So in terms of winter rain versus winter snow and how that also can affect our avalanche patterns at the ski hill. And then even down to the things like the timing of peak and low flows in streams and rivers like Ben was just talking about. And even further into things like the shifts in forest wildfires, forest disease patterns in our area, wildlife ranges and their patterns of emergence and even down to the vegetation species too. So we'll spend the next couple minutes sort of outlining these in a really broad sense and looking at some of the climate forecasts for our ski area. And then we'll finish with a little interesting tidbit, which we think might affect us in the future. So I'll pass it to Veronica to talk a little bit about our environmental management. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so these are some environmental areas of focus that we studied during the 2019 detailed impact assessment that was done at the Lake Louise ski area. Uh, our focuses were on water use, wastewater, surface water, wildlife, wildlife habitat and their movement, uh, vegetation, you know, fuels, chemicals and energy conservation as well. So climate change uh, effects on business and tourism are the focus, but all of these environmental areas uh, were studied and are affected by climate change. And therefore the entire business at Lake Louise uh, will be affected. So the focus today though, will be on uh, a study done by Mr. Perderny uh, at UBC. And their focus was on winter temperature, winter snowfall, winter precipitation and winter rainfall. Uh, and so you can understand how all of these areas uh, of environmental focus need to be considered when we're looking at the effects of business uh, at the ski area. So business and tourism needs here at the ski area, I mean, we do work and live here in the national park. So we respect all the national parks acts and regulations we are considering ecological integrity as our guiding principle out here at the ski area. Um, in order to build these new chairlifts, lodges and infrastructure, we do though need to consider all of those environmental areas of concern. And so today we will focus on climate change risk and risk, um, the risk impact report that was done through Mr. Perdoni at the UBC um, and Jenny will just go on and give you a brief overview of what this ski area uh, looks like right now. Yeah, so as Veronica mentioned, uh, we are uh, living and operating within Banff National Park. We're pretty much right in the middle of the park. Uh, the base area of our ski area with our lodges down here, we're at about 1646 meters. And then the peak of Mount Whitehorn, what we refer to as our front side is that um, 2637 meters. So we've got a pretty large elevation range. 
Um, and then we do also cover Lipalian Mountain. That's what's labeled as Larch over on this side of our ski map. Um, so we've got tons of terrain that people explore in the winter. There's about 1,700 hectares of skiable terrain that people are moving around on, service from nine lifts and 145 ski runs. So it's a huge area for environmental management and consideration for climate change. And this relatively high elevation that we've got here at the Lake Louise Ski Area, along with our distance from the Pacific Ocean really gives us that noticeably colder and longer winter season currently when we compare ourselves to other resorts west of here, such as Revelstoke or spots like that. So looking at this front site, this is mainly southwest aspects, and this is where a lot of the resort operations are focused, aside from the West Bowl area. So a lot of our snowmaking, grooming, that's all focused on this front side and large areas. And then taking you guys to our backside, this is a bit more of a wilderness experience. We don't do any snowmaking out here. Our back bowls are largely in the upper subalpine transitioning to alpine environments. And this is where we tend to see a bit more snowfall and snow storage when we compare it to the front side of our mountain. Um, so I'll pass back to Veronica to jump in a little bit to the climate change report. Great, thank you, Jenny. <clears throat> yeah, so back to our uh, 2019 approved long range plan and detailed impact assessment. Um, part of that detailed impact assessment was having Michael Paderni and his team <clears throat> do a climate change risk and impact assessment report. So there were over 25 supporting documents for the detailed impact assessment done uh, at the ski area. Uh, and in short, uh, Mr. Perderny's team analyzed mean winter temperature as we spoke about, winter snowfall, winter precipitation, and winter rainfall. And out of those two scenarios, <clears throat> uh, you know, we just sort of, what came out of those two scenarios was that the ski season would shrink about 33 to 34 days. Um, and that would give us approximately a four and a half month long ski season. Out of the next scenario, uh, they saw that the ski season may shrink 56 to 58 days, um, and that would give us about a ski season of four months. So typically our ski seasons at this time are roughly six months in length. So, um, in about six, approximately 64 years from now, we may see those ski seasons uh, shrinking down in size. And this is just um, the, the results from the mid-elevation uh, scenarios that were done. So um, the mean winter temperatures are higher throughout um, and all the, all the climate models at all elevations. Um, so another part that's sort of been highlighted throughout various climate assessments have been that have been done for our area really sort of highlight shifts in wildlife patterns and emergence. And the ski area is currently in the middle of a large study studying wildlife movement in the Lake Louise area. And that's all part of our long range planning process mm -hmm. in order to ensure we're uh, not encroaching on sensitive habitats for future developments, in addition to helping us understand these local wildlife patterns. Um, so we're accomplishing that mainly with remote wildlife cameras, and I'll uh, get a video kind of going as I'm chatting to you guys here. But um, a lot of people sort of question why we may need to understand so much about the local wildlife and a big part of our operation does occur in the summer when we uh, run a summer sightseeing gondola. And at that time, it's very evident how busy the wildlife are specifically at our ski hill. We do have a designated wildlife corridor that runs all across the lower elevations of our ski hill in the summer. Part of our operation is to set up electric fences to restrict access to that corridor. And so, a large reason for those electric fences are for us to sort of keep control of our visitors rather than to keep wildlife away from us. So as we're starting to think about changing climates and temperatures uh, shifting to being warmer in the spring than what we have experienced, 
we are starting to think that maybe we'll start to see wildlife showing up on our ski hill at different times of year to what we have been typically used to. So what's currently considered a rare event would be um, occasionally we have had in the final week of our ski season, us sharing our ski slopes with a grizzly bear and having to do a lot of people management to ensure everybody is safe and the bear is not disturbed. Um, while this is currently a very rare event that just happens every now and again, we are starting to consider that we may need more wildlife management considerations for our winter season, which is typically something we only employ during our summer season. Um, so with that, I'll just sort of pass it back to Veronica to summarize. Thank you. And we'll just wrap up here. So really, in, in, you know, to, to summarize and conclude, uh, the climate change will affect many of our operational projects and future developments at the ski area. Um, and we will and have tried to account um, for those anticipated changes in snowfall and in temperature. Thank you. Guys. Hey, thank you so much uh, to the both of you. It's really neat to see all the environmental considerations that are happening, especially as a skier myself. I, I think it's really important that we get to know that. So next up, we have Dr. Justina Ray from the Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. Thank you for joining us, Justina. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm gonna grow, get my presentation ready and, um, whoops, put it up at the beginning. And uh, thank you very, very much for inviting me here today. I think this will be complimentary to what we've heard already. And also just to acknowledge that I'm actually in a very different place from all of you. I'm, 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 uh, I'm in Toronto and, uh, and, and these are the, <clears throat> um, and these are the in Treaty 13 lands. Um, and, uh, and so very, very different place from you all. And I'd rather be where you are, are, but in any case, I'm happy to be invited. So I'll be focusing in this presentation on, um, on climate change and wildlife uh, in the Canadian Rockies. We've already had a bit of a preview um, and very cool videos coming from the Ski Hill uh, cameras. And just to say that Wildlife Conservation Society Canada is not known to all people because we tend to be, uh, we are mostly comprised of scientists who do on the ground field work that informs uh, policy, land use decisions, and so on. We work across northern Canada in particular. We do do some work in the Canadian Rockies as well. And we get generate science and apply the results to relevant conservation processes. And mostly we focus on wildlife. A lot of us are wildlife biologists uh, to understand what their needs are because looking at through their eyes and applying that um, uh, will we'll, uh, we'll, uh, be a good entry point into quite a few uh, problems resolution of problems. So polar bear are the poster child of climate change. Most of us can relate to the fact that they need sea ice. We know that sea ice is disappearing, but this is something that's happening, you know, even though it's very easy for us to understand, it's happening very far away from where most of us live. So it's a little abstract still. And I can assure you that there's a lot of stuff going on right here, even though it's kind of slow moving. And uh, I thought I'd keep on the glacier theme just to, just to you know, look at in, through photographs in this case, you know, this huge change that we can see happened between 1918 and 2011. But most of climate, you know, other than these sort of big weather events that we, we that we experience here and there, and it, most of it's happening in a slow moving way. It's very barely in, uh, barely perceptible. We we are not understanding exactly. We don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis, but we know more and more that it is happening. And so the big question is how do changes like these that we're starting to document and even feel uh, affect the critters with which we share the landscape? Um, and there are many ways in which this has happened. Before I go into some examples, I'll just sort of make this real for people. You know, uh, warmer winters and hotter and drier summers really impact wildlife, both in terms of their own tolerance to temperatures, but also just what those manifest in changes to habitat. Decreasing snowpack is a, is a big problem, as I'll show. Spread of insects and invasive plants can really muck about with both behavior and, and habitat use. Uh, fires across the landscape are getting fiercer and more widespread. This is resulting in a lot of changes in distribution and activities, as we just heard, and weirder, more violent weather. Some people call global warming a climate weirding. 
instead of climate warming or heating. So, um, you know, because it just brings about a whole bunch of weird stuff that we hadn't seen before. And there are winners and losers. The winners are those that will do well under climate change, have very broad tolerance for different temperatures, different habitats. They'll be able to withstand change easier. They can produce babies quickly um, and take advantage of any situation. That's That sort of exemplifies the Canada thistle here, which is an invasive species. So invasive species will do very well. By contrast, more sensitive species like this quite specialized Rocky Mountain Apollo butterfly um, uh, are, uh, are going to be much more ill-equipped to be dealing with the changes of climate. They reproduce more slowly. They have small distribution. So if they get knocked back by a weather event or something, it's very hard for them to recover. The Canadian Rockies has lots of uh, biodiversity and lots of specialists. Um, this, uh, this butterfly was really depends on a particular host plant. And so what happens to that host plant is also very relevant to their response to climate change. Animals that are adapted to northern conditions that are really meant to be in north, they can't really survive in the south, they get overheated, but they also depend on snow cover. Wolverines and lynx have a slightly different part of that story. So wolverines, um, they really required uh, snow in spring to last birth to their kits, keep them protected from predators, warmth, and so forth. Lynx are quite different. I mean, they have these long legs, huge snowshoe-like paws, so they're adapted to snow in a similar way that wolverines are. But one of the impacts is that they do really well, like uh, uh, compared to, for example, bobcats. They have a competitive advantage in, in deep snow. So when snow pack starts to disappear, bobcats can take over. We even have some incidents of male bobcats mating with uh, uh, female lynx. So it can sort of muck about with things in that way. Um, climate change is also becoming a big problem for cold water loving fish like bull trout, which is actually a, a member of the, is, it's like the Arctic char. They need cold, pristine, snow melt fed waters that flow into some of Alberta and BC's largest rivers, you know, and decades ago, the bull trout used to be everywhere. And now they're really um, mostly seen in the Easter Slope watersheds of the Rocky Mountains and the foothills, really restricted range. They have high vulnerability due to stringent requirements for snow uh, for cold water. And then they also compete with some invasive brook trout that like to take advantage of warmer water and disease um, is a problem as well. Many critters join bull trout in the climate change impacts will exacerbate other ongoing threats. Caribou are a great example of this. They're already doing really poorly in parts of the Rockies, as you can see from this map, that pink area is where they used to be. And the green areas are smaller and smaller uh, populations. They've Some of them have been extirpated altogether, including in protected areas like Jasper and Banff and some, not all of the Jasper ones, but some of the populations have. And so, you know, they're doing poorly already. And so climate can just sort of add and exacerbate the impacts that they already have. Caribou don't have very many, much reproductive capacity to bounce back. They're really an embattled species. So what do we do? Last few minutes, save nature. Sage is one of the these, uh, and this is something that we can do in the Rockies in particular. The Rockies has lots of complexity. It's a topographically diverse landscape, provides many more options for uh, uh, species to move, uh, populations to move, facilitating short distance movements and all that. And that, you know, can be very advantageous when you're building landscapes for, for resiliency. And then the, the other really important strategy is to protect and connect key habitats. And this is where you got to look at it through the eyes of the most vulnerable species, look at refuges, areas that are going to persist, habitat persist, but also really you need to be um, uh, uh, safeguarding intact habitat, connecting habitat together and such things. Intact habitats do much better for resiliency for, for wildlife. We do have some left, mostly in the northern part of the Rockies. Uh, but in the, in the area where we are, we also have to be thinking most deliberately about connecting wildlife. And this is important for terrestrial and aquatic species alike. So finally, you know, just follow us on uh, Twitter and Instagram, uh, Facebook. And thanks so much for the invitation. Really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah, so we're going to finish it up with our last presentation from Jody Connell. Jody is the shift program coordinator at the Biosphere Institute. Thank you for coming, Jody. Thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen here. 
hopefully you can see my presentation, not my speaker notes. <laughs> um, You're good, Jody. Great, thanks. So good morning, everyone. Hello, thank you so much for welcoming me here today um, to the Canadian Rockies Youth Summit. We've been really excited about this in the office, as you can imagine. Uh, it's really great to be here. So I wanna kick things off with this quote from Greta Thunberg, leader of the Fridays for Future movement. Um, this quote really resonates with me because I often get asked about climate grief. How do you manage the feeling of kind of being overwhelmed by this whole situation? Um, and I always say to people, well, I have hope um, because I know that we do already have the solutions. In my opinion, all we have to do is facilitate their rollout. We need to influence others to live more sustainably and continue to develop ways of doing that kind of help people take climate into consideration. Um, and I'm gonna try and help you understand the best way to do that. So the first tool that you have is to use your voice. Um, you need to start dropping climate change into conversations so that the topic kind of becomes part of everyday, uh, everyday life, everyday conversations around the dinner table with your friends and so on, because people often trust um, friends and family way more than they trust experts. And you can talk to your peers in a way that is way more likely to influence them. I always suggest people should try to attend different local talks and debates, even if it doesn't seem linked to climate change in any way, as the speaker about how climate change relates to their field. Um, again, another way to kind of bring climate change into the mainstream conversation. You might be surprised at some of the answers that you get. And if there isn't an obvious movement already, don't wait around for other people to enact the change that you want to see. Um, be a leader and start your own passion project. I always think, you know, if you want to, if you want to see your school implement composting, for example, why not speak up, build support and advocate for that particular change at your school? And never be afraid to write to the media or your local representative about an issue that concerns you. People really want to hear from youth today. So tell them that you want more action on climate change. Try to be specific about what you want them to do, uh, which legislation they should change and really why they should change it which leads me to my next point. If you're willing to have these kinds of conversations, make sure that you're educated and informed on the issues so that you can make relevant connections. Um, for example, when friends complain about the ski hills closing due to extreme weather, like we saw this winter, um, tell them that this is likely to happen more often in the future because climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of extreme weather events. This kind of helps people connect the theory of climate change that's all out there and kind of seems far away into somebody's individual reality. And I think it's important to know that indigenous people maintain 80% of the planet's biodiversity on lands which naturally store gigatons of carbon. With their collective knowledge of the land, these people are excellent observers and interpreters of the change that's happening in our environment. And if we want to understand effective long-term solutions to climate change, we need to listen to the lessons that these people have to teach us. Another opportunity for education. So taking action on climate really starts at home. You need to start thinking about your own behavior um, and you know, have a think about your life. What changes can you make to um, reduce your carbon footprint, for example? You know, take action on them and then watch your actions influence other people. And there really is no one size fits all here. Um, what I need to do to reduce my carbon footprint is as individual as me. Uh, and the same goes for you. Um, however, I just want to point out a couple of big hitters uh, on this list here. Uh, buildings in Canmore actually contribute to almost 60% of community greenhouse gas emissions. So anything that you can do to improve the efficiency of buildings is beneficial. It's really not very glamorous, but it is really effective. 
beef production emits 20 times more greenhouse gas emissions per unit of protein on your plate than common plant-based sources. So skipping meat just one day a week um, can make a big impact. It's out of sight and therefore often out of mind, but it takes a lot of energy to pump, treat and heat water. Therefore, conserving water directly reduces energy use. And if food ends up in landfill, it creates methane, uh, a greenhouse gas 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide, if you needed another reason to reduce your waste. So remember that there are organizations operating here in the Bull Valley and beyond uh, with a specific mandate to tackle the climate crisis. You really don't need to recreate the wheel and you can support them by doing any of the things listed here. But in addition, um, if you do have a passion project, something that you're thinking about taking on, it's a good idea to share your project ideas with them um, because they can promote your action. They can help you uh, get to your goals. Um, they have the knowledge and kind of the reach uh, to help you with these kind of things. So don't be afraid to ask people for help. And supporting organizations like these is really the first step that you can take to promote community-wide change. And I'm gonna be really honest here, community-wide change is not an easy task. Um, this is something that the Biosphere Institute is working really hard to do. Um, we have been investigating and implementing various tactical methods to educate people and inspire our community to action. But I just wanted to give you some tips to kind of get you started as you think about these passion projects that you might want to take on. Um, the first thing is to really find something that you're passionate about. This is going to help you motivate, keep you motivated if things get difficult down the line. Um, and I suggest that you really take the time up front to define exactly what it is that you want to do and why. If you can lay it all out in a way that's easy for others to understand, it will make things a lot easier as you move forward. And don't try to do this on your own. Connect with your community, share your idea, build up a network of passionate individuals because they can help you take on the workload. And finally, don't give up because creating change takes time. It takes energy and it takes creativity. And to kind of crib off Adam Robb from earlier, <laughs> never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world because in fact, it's the only thing that ever has. So there kind of ends my whistle stop tour of climate solutions. Um, please reach out if you want any more information on anything touched on today, um, or if you want to learn about any of the community action projects that I'm involved with at work and in my spare time. Um, thanks everyone for listening, and I'm gonna hand it back to Ben for question time. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, I really agree with your last point. Don't give up. Um, this summit especially uh, went through many different iterations. Um, I think like three or four, it went through different phases and it was a completely different thing when I first proposed it. So, um, and like when we had one fail, it would keep going and eventually it came to this. So yeah, that's amazing. So we're gonna start our panel discussion now. Um, I found this one question that I really like um, and they address it to all the panelists. Do you have an aha climate change moment where you realize that it was an important issue? What personal actions did you take? I think um, just like, is there a certain piece of art? Was there a certain um, thing in your work or just something in your personal life that made you realize that climate change was an important issue and what was it? So yeah, if anybody on the panel would like to, has an idea. Justina, I think, great. Uh, yeah, so um, yes and no. I mean, from the one, one uh, from the one hand, you know, it's again, it's like sort of this slowly evolving thing. So it kind of you you realize it over time, and it starts out in the background, and then it just becomes more and more important. Um, and I would say that connecting uh, connecting my own behavior with what I was seeing as a scientist uh, is probably that when those two converged, 
it was probably, you know, when I got my first house or, or started to control my, uh, when I say, I mean, like rent my first place and start to control my, my own feeding habits and so forth. I mean, it was really at that point where I started to become much more deliberate about choices that I was making and connecting them with uh, what I was seeing and experiencing as a scientist. And uh, you do have to make that deliberate connection at some point because you can you can make keep those separate for a while. <laughs> um, and, and so I would imagine that that was probably the closest I had to an aha moment. Yeah, the, I guess the signs can be very um, small and hard to notice. So you're right, if you can make those connections, it definitely helps. Does anybody else want to answer that question? Sure, I'll jump in. I mean, I think it was slightly different for me growing up because I grew up in the UK where climate change was very much a part of my education. Um, and I sort of steered towards the sciences. Um, so these kind of conversations were coming up um, quite often in our classrooms. Um, so I don't know that necessarily I had an aha moment, but I do remember the time when I decided that I was gonna start doing something about it. And uh, that was when I was diving on a coral reef in Indonesia and was kind of floating over this beautiful reef, having the most amazing time. And then all of a sudden the whole thing just went white and dead and there was no fish and there was nothing. And it was just such a contrast to what I'd previously been seeing. And you saw these kind of four or five little fish trying to swim around and you're like, oh, what are you doing? Where are you, you know, how are you surviving? And this, that really, really struck me. It was so stark um, that it kind of, in my mind during that dive, I think I'll remember it forever. I was just like, I need to do something about this. And that was, that was my aha moment on taking action at least. Great. Okay, um, so I guess I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this one's specifically addressed to Caroline. Do you paint all your paintings in one sitting or do you kind of come back days later to finish? So I am not an artist, <laughs> um, but the way that it's called the, the, the type of painting that our artist team is doing is called plain air painting. It's a French word. Um, and so the, the way that we've been doing it is these like backcountry camps. So we'll go out onto the landscape for a couple of days and um, we'll go to a certain location and the artist will set up and kind of take, we'll find the right location. The artist will kind of take in the scene and they work so fast. I thought it was going to take like all day, um, but they'll get a sense of the kind of layout that they want to paint. And within probably three hours, they've gone from blank canvas to kind of the finished painting that I showed in my presentation. And those are kind of like field sketches. And then from those field camps at each location, the artists will do one of those kind of small uh, paintings at each location. And then they'll go back to their studios. And this is like what all kind of plein air artists will do. Um, and then they'll blow it up to those like big landscapes that you'll see in like a gallery. So that's what the artists are gonna be doing uh, this summer after we finish all of our field camp locations. And then we'll take those finished big landscape uh, paintings and put them in the exhibit that we're doing at the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies in early January. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Great, yeah, and be sure to check out the White Museum. I was talking with uh, at a writer's chat last night and that um, sounds like they have some really great galleries and uh, temporary galleries. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Classic Zoom. Um, so next up, I have a question for uh, Dr. Pelto here. Considering that global warming temperatures would result in increased evaporation from the oceans, would increased precipitation rates possibly prove an effective buffer for glacier melt? Uh, largely no, though. I mean, so there's a few things to that. So one is that the like the variability we have in winter snowpack is relatively small relative to how much additional melt we can get with our increased temperatures. So like I mentioned, overall our melt season is, depends on the year, really varies. 
But overall, our melt season is about a month longer now than it historically was. So a couple of weeks of earlier spring, a couple of weeks later, onset of snow in the mountains. And then also, as I mentioned, the extreme temperatures. So it doesn't really matter what snowpack does in terms of it, it, it can't keep pace with the increase in temperature that we've seen and expect to continue to see into the future. Uh, that being said, um, there isn't a lot of data in of alpine snowpacks. The biggest data set above treeline is probably the stuff I've been collecting over the last seven years. And I think that we have seen a slight increase in, in snowpack at the highest elevations. But what we'll see going forward is seasonal snowpacks will be less, not that less falls, maybe more falls, maybe less falls, but the snow lines are rising. So warmer temperatures means the snow line is going to be higher up the mountain. So you'll get more rain events in the winter um, and more melt events in the winter. So we'll probably see reduced seasonal snowpacks, even if, even if we see uh, slightly increased alpine snowpacks. So once you get above tree line, but the, the area of that, you know, of our of alpine is substantial, you know, relative to other regions, but, but not enough to offset that. All right, thank you. And I'm gonna jump over to Lake Louise. So uh, Lake Louise, with the growing tourism numbers, how do you guys plan to keep everyone safe and to continue with your current plans? Do you guys have plans that have been put into place if tourism outgrows kind of the current projected numbers that you guys have? I can, I can jump in here and Jenny jump in anytime. Um, so our winter seasons are our busiest seasons and um, we have managed to keep everyone safe throughout those very busy winter seasons with um, all the planning that we have in place. So in the summertime, um, the majority of our guests, uh, you know, the numbers are less in the summertime. Um, so I would say, yes, we, we do plan and we, we can keep everybody safe with our current plans. Um, and we work hand in hand with Parks Canada as well. Uh, when they start to see those numbers increasing down in the valley, um, we, we're up on the mountain and they start moving those, those guests up towards us. All right, so you have some sort of, uh, I guess, relationship with Park Canada, Parks Canada Bell kind of help you decide what are the best measures to take at that time? Yeah, we definitely have an ongoing daily uh, relationship with Parks Canada. Okay, neat. Jenny, did you have anything to add there? No, I think you covered it all. And in terms of like long-term projections for seeing lots more visitors, um, that's a lot of what our long range planning was all about. And you know, planning where we might need a new lodge and then in terms of potential wildlife issues, even down to where would we put a new lodge so that we're not interacting with bear migrations and animal movements and stuff like that. So throughout the whole long range plan, there was sort of different um, capacity limits, I guess, considered for the ski area, both for winter operation and for summer operations. All right. Yeah, there's definitely more questions I want to ask, but we are running out of time. So I'm going to ask one more question to the entire panel. And it's just going to be very general. Um, what are just like, what are some ways we can take action? So, and it'd be great if it's uh, just very specific to your presentation. What are ways we can get involved, maybe in wildlife and in glaciers or, um, you know, just in our small communities or even with local businesses? How can we help them fight the effects of climate change and how can we help them prevent climate change? Justina? Yeah, I think um, awareness, uh, individual awareness is the, the absolute place to start. I mean, one of the things I tried to convey in my presentation is that a lot of this stuff happens, that it's very invisible. Wildlife in many ways have learned to adapt to humans in extraordinary ways that we don't even have any idea about. We can go about our business and, and uh, not know about all these, uh, these critters that are in our proximity, the different ways they're using the land that we are dominate. 
And so understanding more about, um, you know, those, those, those animals, but also the, the changes that are happening and how they're, how they're, how, how they're manif how they're basically expressing themselves and, and uh, impacting, um, you know, the ecological systems in which we are embedded. We're not separated from them. We are embedded in mm -hmm. these ecological systems. Then I think uh, people's growing awareness that will help them understand wh what kind of action to take. I mean, it was like Chloe said just before our presentation, her, as she became more aware of it, it was more and more clear to her what, um, what she should do. And I think probably the same as for Ben. <laughs> Many of us are, are, are started on our pathways because we became really aware. Caroline? Caroline, sorry. <laughs> Take our climate challenge. Go to our website or rockiesrepeatfilm.com. Um, like Justina said, it's, an, it's a way you can raise awareness with people in your community and that follow you. Um, and yeah, you don't have to change the world in a big way. You don't have to be a scientist necessarily. You can be an artist or a dancer or whoever, like however you want to express yourself and share your feelings and, and just try to inspire people to take an action. Um, so yeah, definitely encourage you. The, the challenge is open now and open through to September 30th. So uh, head on over to our website. Yeah, art is uh, for sure, one of the best ways to engage with people and raise awareness on a subject, especially climate change, since we can document, as we're doing with the Rockies, as you're doing with the Rockies Repeat, you're documenting how climate is changing our landscapes over time. That's really neat. Does anybody else want to add on to that final question about how can we create action? I'm just going to say, Justina nailed it on the head. Like, it's, it's about mm -hmm. awareness and um, the more aware you become, the more action you understand what you need to take and, and in your local area and for yourself. Um, so it really is a learning journey. Um, you know, become aware and then decide what action that you want to take um, and support others that are already doing the same thing. Uh, if you're in the Bow Valley, reach out to Bow Valley Climate Action. They're working on things all the time. You know, if you want to do a project that's not necessarily run by yourself or controlled by yourself there are plenty of organizations out there that are doing these things that would absolutely love to have your help um, so if you can't think of your own thing join someone else okay thank you so this has been um it's a hot topic i didn't say that title but <laughs> climate change panel uh, we've had dr justina ray jody connell dr ben pelto caroline hedden jenny bishop and Veronica Whitney Crossland. Thank you all so much for coming. I think this was very successful. So, um, Yeah, and I guess from now I'm just going, we do have a break for lunch, but at 12 p.m. we have our keynote speaker, Cowboy Smith X, which is gonna be really amazing. So see us then. Uh, Mallory, if you wanna talk about the Zoom links, I'm not really sure what's happening there. Uh, yeah, so we're just switching over Cowboy Smith X. So